Hello and welcome to The Arise interview. 60 minutes of big questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insight and critical analysis. I'm Charles Anyagolo. Coming up in the next hour, the Nigerian House of Representatives passes a bill that aims to stimulate the Nigerian economy amid the ravages and the continued march of the coronavirus. It's called the Emergency Economic Stimulus Bill and it aims to protect the country from the economic downturn brought about by COVID-19. The Nigerian Central Bank has already unveiled two stimulus packages to try to cope with the collapse of crude oil prices. But even with all these interventions, some economists are predicting that the collapse in oil prices could contract Africa's largest economy and push it into recession this year. We have analysis. And later, in the midst of a planetary pandemic, the United States, a country known for its infectious energy, is locked down by infection, forced into hibernation. As the number of cases there surges to around 70,000, America confronts the reality of tackling the coronavirus crisis with 18 states imposing stay-at-home orders and medical staff and hospitals under tremendous pressure. We'll speak to a Nigerian doctor on the line from Atlanta, Georgia, in a moment. Now, there are dire economic warnings for Africa's largest economy that if the consequences of the coronavirus continue for some time to come, it's likely to cause what could well be the worst economic contraction in more than a decade. And so the Nigerian House of Representatives has passed for a third reading a bill to save jobs, support businesses and help Nigerians survive. Added to the two stimulus packages already unveiled by the Nigerian Central Bank, amounting to billions of dollars, it's all looking rather impressive. But there are those who say the government should do more, cut further, prioritize more, get rid of all non-essential expenses and transfer the funds to support the necessary sectors. We do not have enough hospital beds, intensive care units, respirators, testing kits, thermal disinfection equipment, and personal protective equipment. We are also short of the numbers of medical personnel required to manage a significant national outbreak of the disease. The grant that gives companies a rebate on companies' income tax to the value of 50% of PAE deductions, so long as those companies maintain their PAE rules as of 1st March 2020, to 31st of December 2020. It also suspends import duties on medicines, medical equipment, and protective gear and other medical materials as may become essential to managing and eradicating COVID-19. COVID Well, for more on this, I'm joined now in Abuja by Aliyu Shatter Issa, who is a financial inclusion specialist. And a little bit later, we'll be joined also by Dr. Sam Ahmadi, who is, among other things, an Arise News analyst. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. What do you make of that, Bill? Uh, well, it's <laughs> rather late than never. Uh, when I saw that of um, United States, when they said United States was going to bring in about two trillion dollars, you know, into the system, I expected you know exactly what is going to follow suit mm. with the Nigerian National Assembly. But thankfully, they've done that. But we need to critique the bill of course. and see how it trickles down to the last mile, as the man on the street. Now they have talked about PE. They've talked about you know cushioning the effect for housing. Pay, pay as you earn. Pay as you earn. Right. You know, you know. That's the tax. Exactly. Right. Now they've not also talked about the compulsory pension that employers need to also contribute mm. together with the employer. So if you put all these factors into consideration, you realize that yes, in as much as it's coming as a way of cushioning the effect, we also need to look at the Nigeria larger economy because mm. 97, uh, 75 percent of Nigeria economy is driven by the informal sector. 
Now, if you have 75% of your economy being run through the informal sector, and you are bringing palliative measures that does not really trickle down to mm. the people who are actually at the bottom of the pyramid, then you already have a problem in your hands. Now, this goes to show you the financial inclusion strategy that CBN has brought in, which has not properly accommodated those at the lowest of the bottom mm. of the pyramid. Neither of the bills, in fact. E exactly. Um, because, I mean, the, the, these bills address mostly pr the private sector, exactly. really, and, and the people who are sort of registered, known businesses, businesses, and the people they employ. Exactly. And just the formal sector. Mm. And do you know that even the GDP we calculate in this country, we don't really factor the informal sector into it. Mm. But they are the larger players of our economy, the stimulus that, we, that the economy is using to operate. Now, let me take it, let me drill it down to the people down there. You have a lot of people who are involved in, a, in different value chains. For instance, they are into fruit selling, mm. they are into um, normal basic full item selling, they roast, you know, yam on right. the street. The hawkers on the, the hawkers, street. You name them. You see, these are the people who actually, you know, make the economy go around. But if you've not financially included them, there's no how you can actually give them palliative measures. Mm. Because what you will be seeing is just like the trader money that we see. You'll be rolling cash to people who will just see it as basic benefit coming from government because they voted you in. Mm. So what we need to do is to ensure that we drill down and ensure that most policies that we pass are implemented and well executed. If that is done, we will not even need this bill in the first place. What we we'll need is just like um, uh, a bonus that the government will announce and they will disburse it around the channel. Because if, for instance, you have just 40 to 45 percent of people banked, and the larger percentage are unbanked. Now, even if you want to give palliative measures, how do you send this mm. money down to them? Because you don't really have any audit trail. There's no data. But with financial inclusion strategy, you will be able to accommodate them and bring in a whole lot of programs. I will also drill down there. Now, you can introduce what we call micro pension. They have introduced that, but it has not kicked off. It has not kicked off because these guys are largely wage earners. Mm. And we've not captured them into the financial hub. Now, you also have the micro housing. If you're talking about pushing the effort for housing just for people who are actually in the formal sector, how about those in the informal sector? And we know the housing deficit that we have in this country. Right. Well, let me, let me just make the point that the uh, members of the National Assembly did say yeah. that this was the first move. In other words, that they were simply rushing out a bill to try and cope with people who are being, you know, likely to become unemployed and all that sort of thing, to, to give some sort of relief to those businesses that are no longer able to earn because they've had to essentially close shop. They're saying that further down the road, as things continue to evolve, that they're going to um, bring in more sort of measures to try and deal with. Um, you're here with me, but we're observing the social, six, distance. Yeah, the social distance. There's a yeah. considerable distance uh, between us. Um, what then would you recommend? I mean, I know you've mentioned a number of things, but I mean, you're, you're not entirely happy with this first step, but as the government says, it is a first step. Yeah. Uh, well, what I would recommend basically is let's look at how we can give out palliative measures that will drill down to the people at the bottom of the pyramid in the sense that we are looking at shutting down the economy. And if people sit at home, we have a lot of people who, if they don't go out on a daily basis, they won't survive, they won't survive basically. Right. So what we need to do right now is to get basic home items, foods, and see how we can distribute them across to probably the local government and even the wards that we have so that these people can have basic touch to go and you know, um, um, redeem these items, uh, basically. But apart from that, if you also look at the health sector, we have serious problem in our health sector, of course. I don't want to sound like a broken record. Mm. It's what everybody is aware of, and we know it. If the Western world are having challenges and they are crying for help, as the case may be. What is actually happening in Nigeria is what will happen 
if we have this massive um, outbreak that we have no, in absolutely. Spain I mean, and Italy and America is talking about 70,000. <laughs> I can't imagine exactly. that happening in Nigeria. We will, we will definitely be in a quagmire. And, and the problem I also find with this bill is that it's giving relief to people who are importing medical equipment and all that. But where are they going to import it from? I mean, where is it actually going to come from? Although, I mean, I suppose the government could make, you know, special concession yeah. um, to, to allow that because I mean in America for instance they're allowing things to be imported in, in many other parts in Europe and that sort of thing P things are being brought in from different countries. Sure, sure. you see um, that also goes to tell you about the composition of our economy. You see Nigeria is a largely consuming nation. That's the reason why you see that the Naira and dollar keeps fighting mm. and the Naira will keep devaluating in as much as we keep consuming and we don't put all these essentials into consideration. Mm. Now, when we don't actually plan to create industries that thrive, but you want to ask yourself, on which economy and which factors of production will you plug these industries into operate? Mm. Why? Because we don't have stable electricity to even power most of these industries. If we had that, and most of these people that are in the informal sector, or we call them indirect labor, they would have had access. Yes, I mean, the, the, the point, of course, is that, I mean, I have to take a break now, yeah. but I'll come back to you in a minute. The point is that, you know, those things are already there, that we don't have electricity. So exactly. we've got to worry about how to deal with it yeah. in those circumstances. Yeah. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, as we continue our chat about the COVID-19 economic stimulus that's making its way through the Nigerian parliament, the bill that is. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolo. So the third stimulus package Nigerian authorities have unveiled since the coronavirus pandemic took hold to try to cope with the effects of COVID-19 and the resultant collapse of crude oil prices. The latest package in the form of a bill which is passing through the House of Representatives is aiming to provide relief on things like corporate tax liability, suspension of import duties on selected goods such as medical equipment, medicines and personal protective gear needed for the treatment and management of COVID-19, as well as deferral of residential mortgage obligations, among other things. Things. The target is the private sector, which is having to deal with disruptions that it's probably never experienced before in peacetime. The bill has been sponsored by all principal officers of the House of Representatives and is awaiting the Senate's review and passage before being presented to the President for his assent. Under the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Center for Disease Control, rapidly scale up testing capabilities through the establishment of nationwide testing centers so that we may begin to determine the actual numbers of Nigerians who are already for this COVID-19 disease. Two, to direct the Federal Ministry of Education to immediately make available hostels in the now vacated federal government colleges across the country for use as emergency care centers and isolation units by the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Center for Disease Control if it becomes necessary to do so. Three, to mandate the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Center for Disease Control to immediately develop contingency plans for the establishment of emergency care facilities at the federal government colleges. These contingency plans should include cost estimates for the provision of equipment, material, medicines, and other such requirements as may become necessary. And I want to speak on behalf of the 360 members of this house here to urge the Senate to look at this bill within this spirit and also concur with the speed of the light, if I may borrow the words of Osai, in the call of society. Mr. Speaker, this is a bill that will be for the good of the generality of the people of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Well, with me in the Abuja studio, Ali Shata Issa, who is a financial inclusion specialist. And with me in our off-site studio, Dr. Sam Ahmadi, who is, among other things, an Arise News analyst. And uh, Dr. Sam, thank you very much indeed for persisting with us. Uh, this is, of course, a, a studio that we've just set up in the circumstances, so trying to get the sound and everything up and running. But um, 
You've been looking at this bill by, that's been introduced into the, the National Assembly. Uh, it's making its way through Parliament. Um, is that what you would recommend to the government and how they should respond to this crisis? Or would, would you like more you know, than what is actually being offered by way of support, having looked at that bill yourself? I think uh, first I want to commend them, but I'll ask for more. First, this bill could succeed in dealing with just one issue, which is employment. And clearly, uh, we're expecting that the crisis, the global economic crisis, the crisis of COVID-19, and of course the crisis of the, oil, the show of, of, of power in, between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Russia will definitely impact you know, adversely on our economy. And so essentially, companies will witness rising cost of business, you know, shrinking market opportunities, and of course, essentially, that will lead to possible downsizing. So this bill tries to offset that incentive by providing 50% uh, tax rebate. Now the question is, if you look at the back of envelope calculation, what typical business, businesses will do is to look at what are, are they going to lose in terms of wage bill that probably they want to reduce up to, let's say, 20%, 30% of their, of, their, of their workforce. And then you look at what does that amount in that and Kobo. And then what does 50% rebate you know, of tax mean to them? So basically, it, it might not be a perfect uh, rationality here. You can't say that this uh, bill will essentially uh, reduce uh, employment loss by X percent because you have to square it as against what they will gain when they keep those people employed and take the rebate. So that's still hypothetical. Then the second point is the issue around housing. A very good improvement. But then for, don't forget that it's, it's tailored towards those who are making contributions to national housing funds. So basically, this will cater to civil servants who arguably have uh, the, the, the least wage in terms of income and salaries compared with private sector person. But of course, not many uh, civil servants, especially those in the parastatals, uh, also contribute, contribute to this fund. So primarily, the target of these benefits will be limited. That's number, number two point here. You're going to deal with a limited number of persons. Uh, in many other countries, for example, you have total freeze of, 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 of rent for like three months, which means everybody who is, who is on rented apartment would not be required to pay rent for some uh, significant period of time to allow for a rebound in terms of both, both uh, uh, household income and of course the general economy. The bigger point here is that we, are, we don't have data. You know, most of our citizens are not just unbanked, they are captured in basic data. So we don't know where they live. So the money can't even follow them. So what government is looking at is the supply side of it is easier to manage. The central bank, following the IMF template, has also focused on ensuring financial liquidity in the system, making sure that businesses, especially small businesses, do not go under by way of easing out some of the obligations in terms of both uh, lending, borrowing, and of course um, dealing with exchange rates and all that. But those are within the, the supply side of it, ensuring that business keeps strong, ensure that there's, uh, lending is easy to be done, borrowing is easy to do, but essentially the demand side of it, which probably you know, has more impact in terms of uh, co consumer welfare. You know, in the welfare economics, you basically look at what are the consumers getting, what are the citizens getting. And that's where the European countries, America, will focus on what they call tax and transfer. So the tax, they give tax credits because most citizens pay tax, and those tax credits are significant. In our own instance, we are the unbanked, on captured uh, informal sector, we find it difficult to find a way to sustainably reach out to them. So that's going to be a major challenge to any stimulus. You know, as long as it's focused, essentially more so when we are actually dealing more with right. the poverty crisis, even arguably more okay. than the productivity uh, I'm crisis. I'm going to just come in so, there. Um, so, um, so I'm, I'm going to just come in there, Dr. Sam, because obviously we need to keep our answers reasonably brief so we can bring the other participant in this discussion in, but you've made some very good points there. And let me just pick you up on the issue of the supply side and the focus of the government. You, you've clearly made the point that they simply don't have the statistics to be able to reach everybody who needs um, to be supported in these circumstances. So talking about those businesses themselves, because I've heard 
a lot of complaints from the private sector. Is it your sense that there was much discussion with businesses and the private sector to agree the parameters and the content of this bill? I mean, was there consultation between the House of Representatives, the central bank, the businesses, and so on? No, there was not. I mean, this is, like they said, this is a quick response, but essentially, even with the time they had, they could have invited more, you know, focus group. They could have got the business community, to, you know, as part of working on it, except something underground. By the way, the Chamber of Commerce have also been talking about it. They have issues. For example, think about power. You know, the, the basic challenges that you know, they're facing will be compounded with, you know, expected, you know, you know, economic impact of this crisis. You know, this is a headwind. Plenty of them coming. So I think the bill perhaps did not benefit much from the rigor of both the business and the, the, the economic science, you know, group, epistemic community didn't benefit much. It's populist in the sense that look, it's easy to say 50% rebate, but what it amounts to in terms of the tax, you know, tax uh, burden or tax uh, outlay of a company of either small, medium, or large company is arguable vis-a-vis -vis what. They will, they will save if they, if they let off, let's say, a particular company with, let's say, 2,000 or 200 uh, workforce drop into 50 or 70. That savings will be significant, perhaps arguably far more than a 50% rebate. So I, I think there could be a lot more stimuli you know, on the supply side. But really, the problem of the Nigerian economy is that there's no strong linkage you know, between the uh, supply side and the demand side. Wages are not rising. And if you look at Oxfam report around inequality, Part of the drivers is that we have very poor labor rights, labor laws. We have very poor protection service, protections for workers, and therefore, and of course, unionism, bargaining power is low. So essentially, it, it, the crisis that if you're improving supply side, the trickle down effect is that you expect that that will rebound back to welfare of workers, household income, improvement in social amenities, access to healthcare, education. But our economy is disarticulated. So a solution, band aid in the supply side, doesn't necessarily return to, to the demand side. And that's the problem we're going to have, that our stimulus might be so lopsided that even though businesses don't go under as expected, but families and households will terribly go under. And so we need to think around finding a way to, to get back to public sector economics, looking at how do you drive productivity that will also come down to improvement in household income. And that is also going to reinforce back to productivity because spending power is critical to job side economy after expected recession we're going to have. Spending power of the public so that they can also drive in a sustainable way productivity. I guess this is a tough job for us, but I don't think National Assembly... Right, the okay. Um, the that's the, the rather we'll long version beyond, of a brief you know, response, some, but the, very the comprehensive... Yeah comprehensively put and which is um which we, we appreciate uh, dr sam but stay with us because we want to talk to you some more let me bring in ali shata isa who's a financial inclusion specialist who's with me in the studio i mean we have analyzed this bill yeah. now to, to some extent um we understand what the major objective is we understand the fact that it's not reaching a lot of nigerians Correct. but in terms of what it has set out to do which is aiming itself at businesses do you think it is achieving its objective uh well i wouldn't say that to, to some larger extent it's just like they said to cushion the effect mm. so it's just like scratching the surface as the case may be you know, if you, during my, my opening glee analysis, I did mention um, the inequality between the formal and the informal sector. And if you have a, an economy that is largely based, you know, on, with the informal sector activities, it is no, no, I, I understand difficult. that, but the point I'm making, and we've got about a minute before we take a break, yeah. is basically, given the fact that the informal sector is not within this bill, yeah. let's just look at the, 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 the formal sector that the bill targets. It's, it's trying to target. Right. You know, even at that, I did, you know, give my analysis, talking about the PE, pay as you earn. Right. You know the contributory. Right. So as far as you're concerned, it doesn't do this. It's job. not holistic. Right. It, yeah. it, there should be a lot more. Exactly. Okay. We'll talk exactly. about this more in a moment. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the COVID-19 economic stimulus bill that's making its way through the Nigerian Parliament. Stay with us. 
Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagulu. As you may know by now, the Nigerian House of Representatives has passed an economic stimulus bill which is aimed at protecting employees from the loss of their jobs as a result of the coronavirus outbreak, suspending import duties on medical equipment and introducing a moratorium on mortgage obligations. The bill, which was sponsored by all principal officers of the House of Representatives, is now awaiting the Senate's review and passage from where it will proceed to President Buhari's desk for his assent. Among other things, it grants a 50% income tax rebate to affected companies for the rest of this year, but questions have been raised about the adequacy of the tax measures and whether it involves cash refunds or de deductions against the income tax payable by companies. It's also unclear why the bill makes oil producing companies ineligible for the relief, given that their businesses will be significantly challenged financially by the fall in crude oil prices and the effect this will have on the employment security of their staff. Well, with me in the studio in Abuja, Ali Shata Issa, who is a financial inclusion specialist, and with me in our off-site studio in Abuja, Dr. Sam Amadi, who is, among other things, an Arise News analyst. And let me come back to you, um, Dr. Uh, Issa, uh, because you were talking about this earlier. Um, before we went on break. But let me move away, because we've kind of gone over that ground yeah. a bit. As I understand it, the Buhari government, by way of the central bank, is already doing quite a bit. It's got a 3.5 uh, trillion Naira stimulus package, and uh, this move by the National Assembly is to complement that effort. Yeah, sure. If you look at it, mm. it still boils down to how this money are going to be distributed, and how they are going to trickle down to the last man on the street. I know that currently, the, this current administration runs a welfare um, system. Where they runs give, a, a welfare yeah, right? Welfare or is system. attempting to yeah, run. Yes. Right. You know, they give palliative measures right. in conditional cash. So do you think that system that. could be used to advance cash to people? Yeah, it, it could be used. The conditional cash transfer, which I actually participated in, could be used you know, to cushion the effect. Yeah, but the problem is that I'm the government aware. doesn't really have that much cash, does it? Uh, I think we do, if you ask me, because um, you asked the question, most of the money that, mm. the money is that they said they've recovered, the stolen money they've recovered from stolen um, um, uh, politicians or people who looted the money. We need to utilize these monies now that we have a challenge at our hand. Mm. So at the same time, I also know that World Bank has given some kind of you know, uh, money to us for the conditional cash transfer, which they've started. And I am aware that a lot of states have benefited. Mm. You know, they pay um, every two months 10,000 Naira, yes. you know, to the uh, poorest, the lowest and the poorest of uh, uh, society. What they should do is to, you know, follow that trajectory right now to ensure that they push more money into that same system. Make sure that it trickles down and captures a lot of people at the bottom of the pyramid. Because if you look at it right now, most of them don't even have money at hand to go stock, like most privileged Nigerians have done. So if you are going to shut down the economy right now, I can guarantee you that in the next 24 hours, you have a lot of people who are going to go hungry. And if they go on hungry, there is a little you can do to make them or persuade them to stay at home. Mm. They will definitely revolt. And that is going to create more crisis for us. And that's exactly why we are seeing more crime rates so in the country. Why? Because of the economic imbalance that we have in the system. So for me, I will emphasize that if, just like Kenya is doing, most there's this assertion that you know exchange of even cash itself mm. can make you contract the virus. So Kenya is using its mobile money system to pass money through its citizens and is encouraging digital transaction within an ecosystem. If Nigeria can emulate such, we'll be able to capture most of these people into the financial hub. Then when we are talking about palliative measures, it's easier for us to send it down to them because it will trigger down to the person on the last. Right, okay, uh, well, let me, let me go to our off-site studio. 
and bring in Dr. Sam uh, Maddy. Um, Sam, obviously, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. I don't know if you've been hearing the chat so far that we've been having in the studio. Sure. A lot of sure. concern being raised that this money is not going to trickle down to the people at the bottom. And given the number of those people who are outside the formal economy, it's raising considerable concern. I mean, do we have any idea at all, not to put you on the spot there, but do we have any idea at all about how many people are actually going to be touched by this bill that is passing through Parliament? Well, that's a tragedy. You know, our laws do not profit from legislative research. And part of what you get from USS, where we have Center for Policy, Center for Public Finance, is that these bills will start from a premise of numbers. So we're targeting X amount. So if you do this transfer, if you put $3 trillion, this number of people will get it. We don't have those research. So essentially, this is all speculation and guesswork. But let me say what I think will happen. If you look at the central bank intervention, well, of course, primarily focused on the supply side, of course, in terms of credit, in terms of the enablement for more investment, you know, uh, getting the uh, debtors a little bit, give them a little bit room, and of course, providing cash that could help to support uh, uh, production. The idea here is that somehow, the, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the rising storm, the rising tide carries everybody. So if we're able to counteract against economic decline and uh, some growth, then it will trickle down. But if you look at the transfer, the type that uh, the vice president has done in the past, the problem is that first, it's so limited. The number of people who, who, got, who, got, who were touched were few. The bureaucrats around it and accountability is also not that clear. What, if you look at China, what has happened in other countries is that the, the, the cash, cash transfer it's not just a standalone, it's not an add-on, it's mainstreamed into the policy, the economic policy of government. The idea of economic policy making becomes to find a way to deal with poverty. You ask the question, are we a welfare economy? I think we're confused, we're doing a confused economic model. Our economic policies are essentially not welfareistic, but some of our political actions, add-on, you know, in, 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 episodic interventions like the total money seem to be welfareistic. But if you look at the design of our economy, it's not welfareistic. And that's why we're having a compounding crisis of poverty. If you look at in the, when Obasanjo was in power in the early 2000, we were talking about 60 to 70 percent of Nigerian poor. But with this print, uh, um, statistics, I think we go higher. We talk about extreme poverty. So primarily, what is missing? We have numbers. We don't know where these poor people are. We don't know the difference between urban and rural. If you look at allocation of 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 of, of, of for funds through the usual FAC, you discover that how do we ensure the money that goes to the local government? We are some of the rural poor. The large, large chunk of the in northern Nigeria that is largely right. not so urbanized. Okay. Well, let, let me just leap in there, um, Dr. So Sam, how do we and ensure ask that you. Get the, the let me just read I don't mean to interrupt you, but let me just come in there and ask you this because we haven't got that much time, and I also need to bring in. Uh, our other guest before we have to say goodbye. Is it reasonable? I mean, we've, we've analyzed the problems, the issues, the questions, the doubts. Is it reasonable to assume that this bill is just the first quick reaction to this pandemic and that if things get worse, there will be reconsiderations and possible you know, possibly new, more, a, a sort of a more expansive bill, more expansive bills, if you like, and the situation, as the situation continues to evolve? Yes, I think it's reasonable to assume so. It's a good first start. We are still, you know, analyzing the risk and the damage that this crisis will cause on the economy. And so I think as we go ahead, there will be other interventions to amend, to complement and supplement what they have done. And the focus, therefore, would be not just about uh, cash or, or rebate, but about policy, about interventions and distribution. We have to focus more on redistribution as well as focus on growth and move away from thinking about growth in terms of the financial sector only, but see how we can cause agriculture to create spin-offs that will impact the life of people in the rural area. Maybe some big scale land reform will be part of this. I think we need to be much more social, we need to infuse sociology and economics to drive new policy to deal with this challenge. But this is a good start, but I think it will be amended, supplemented to capture uh, the risk as we, as we analyze them better. And uh, just uh, uh, 
probably finally from you, Dr. Sam, just in terms of the next steps for this bill. I mean, I know it's still got to go through the Senate. It's got to get the president's assent. I mean, how long do you reckon before these, um, you know, these measures start to actually affect people in the private sector? I think with the crisis, the urgency and the passion, I expect that the Senate to wrap this up perhaps in the next two, three weeks and be signed by the president. But I would like the Senate to think about expanding this bill, catch on some of these issues we have raised and perhaps they go to a committee of the whole and sign up. But basically, by end of April, we should probably have a, a law before and then we look, we we'll take in terms of implementation. I think by May, definitely, we we'll have we should have something with the urgency the House started with. I think the Senate should be that urgent and serious. And then perhaps by May, there should be some degree of implementation. OK, let, let me bring in uh, Ali Yushata Issa, who is with me in the studio here. Um, this bill, in some ways, is almost unprecedented, isn't it? I mean, because it was sponsored by both the Speaker and I think just under a dozen other members of the House. And to that extent, it is very representative of the membership of the House. And to that extent, I mean, that underscores the urgency that's been attached to it and the fact that this is something that they really want to get moving pretty quickly. So it's a good first step, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, just like um, the Speaker said when he moved the bill, he said um, this is actually a bill for the people who actually elected them into government mm. because they are representing the people. So, yes, it's a people's bill. It's a welcome development, at least for them to have thought about moving such bill at this auspicious time. For me, it's timely. But what would you fix right now is to look at the glitches mm. that we have in the, in, in, the law, uh, in, in the bill and see how we can improve on it. And probably what I expect them to be doing right now, I'm talking about the executive and mm. the legislator, is to have a situation room as a crisis situation room because we are actually in a mess, in a crisis right now where we have different technocrats that mm. are going to sit down to analyze different measures that can be taken as, quickly. As things move forward. As, exactly. Okay. As I, effectively I say, as possible. Okay. Yeah. I want to say Aliyu Shata Issa, financial inclusion specialist, and Dr. Sam Amadi, Arise News analyst. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Thank you very much for having me. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead, including we'll speak to a Nigerian doctor in the United States about how the country is coping with the coronavirus mm. pandemic. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. In the United States, more than 10,000 new cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed in the past 24 hours. More than 1,000 people have died across the country. In Washington, D.C., Congress continues to fast-track the approval of the historic $2 trillion bill to support the country's economy. Across the U.S., people and politicians are rushing to react to the pandemic as the World Health Organization warns that America could become the next center of the outbreak after China and Southern Europe. So how is the world's richest country reacting to the health crisis? Of course, well, I got it in New York at the beginning of March, uh, and it was a, it's a grim illness. There's no other way of describing it. I felt really unwell. Uh, it's like a very, very bad dose of the flu is the simplest way of describing it. It last, lasted for me about three days of the, the, the severe bit. I never felt breathless and I never for one moment thought I was going to die. Now, I'm now well past the infective period. I went back to work yesterday and I'm going back to work today to, to, to help with my colleagues and, and to see patients who, and to speak to patients who are clearly anxious about their symptoms. But as your piece has shown, you know, you can get through this. We can get through to the other side. Italy, as you've said, have plateaued out their numbers of deaths. We know in China the number of new cases has, has plummeted. So as long as we follow the rules, we will all get through this. I got tested in one of the hubs. I'm not sure if they exist anymore. But then I came home and went to bed for three days. I self-medicated with simple paracetamol, fluids, time and at the end of it chicken soup to be to be absolutely honest uh, but nothing nothing more than that now i never got breathless and i think if people get covid19 and they're getting worsening breathlessness and they have to ring 111 or if it's really dire ring 999 but i never got that i got the the terrible ache the 
pain, the uh, high temperature, the, the hot and cold, which is called rigor. So I got all of those symptoms, but I didn't get any of the complications that some others are getting, especially those who have coexisting uh, serious physical, underlying physical conditions, which fortunately I don't have. Well, we're trying to cross over to Atlanta, Georgia, to speak to Dr. Bato Amu, who is a seasoned internal medicine specialist who's been practicing in Atlanta for many years and who's been in the thick of this crisis. But for some reason, the phone lines are not connecting at the moment. We can't get him um, in any other medium apart from his telephone. And for some reason, this, the, the studio line is not connecting. But just to continue updating you on what is going on as we continue trying to reach him um, with every day more and more people around the world are of course facing news they've contracted the coronavirus according to Johns Hopkins University in the United States which has been keeping a tally of all this there are now almost half a million cases now confirmed globally with the true number expected to be far higher. As uh, we mentioned, in the U.S., more than 10,000 new cases have been confirmed in the past 24 hours. More than 1,000 people have died across that country. Uh, Congress, of course, continuing to fast-track the approval of the historic $2 trillion bill to support the country's economy. Um, that uh, bill has passed the Senate now, which gave it its unanimous uh, approval. The House of Representatives is also due to vote on the measures. But uh, let's take you now to Atlanta, Georgia, and speak to Dr. Bato Amu, who is a seasoned internal medicine specialist who's been practicing in Atlanta for many years. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Dr. Amu. Uh, give us a sense of what's happening across the U.S. following that dramatic upturn in the number of cases with now some 70,000 cases confirmed across America and of course many unconfirmed on top of that. Uh, yes, uh, yes Charles. Um, <clears throat> there is really uh, uh, an epidemic and, and, and a tragedy going on now in the U.S. Um, the um, as the as the number of uh, coronavirus cases continues to climb, uh, especially uh, in New York State and most particularly New York City, uh, the country is on um, high alert, and um, we are battling it as best as we can. It's, again, not, not just New York City. I mean, there's California, Louisiana, even here in Georgia. Uh, the cases keep rising. But it should not generate too much anxiety. Um, we may have had a, a small lag period in that. Uh, and again, I'm not sure, and I cannot speak for the government or uh, uh, or the CDC or anybody in particular, but there seemed to have been a slight lag period at the beginning. However, efforts are being ramped up uh, across the board, uh, both from the federal government and multiple state governments to check the situation. It is really a dire emergency, um, <clears throat> but nothing that we can't handle at the end of the day. Well, I mean, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, in the last 24 hours, you've had a dramatic increase of 10,000 new cases. And uh, you've also got the World Health Organization predicting that the United States is going to be the epicenter of the disease globally um, in, within the next few days or, or so. I mean, let's talk about you in particular. You're a doctor and you'd be considered a frontline health worker in the U.S. Do you consider yourself to be at risk from this coronavirus disease? Absolutely. Absolutely. Not just me, but all healthcare workers 
uh, at increased risk because of the increased exposure. You know, we make contact with these people. We make contact with them even before they're diagnosed. And the challenge is actually being able to screen people appropriately to, in order to know who to quarantine or who to separate and who to, to let go. Uh, uh, the, 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 the problem, one of the major problems here has been the unavailability or inadequate supply of testing materials. And, and that brings me to a point. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, the, the number of cases jumping in the U.S., and that is expected. That is expected because, because <clears throat> as testing materials become more readily available, more people will be tested, and the numbers will, should be expected to go up exponentially before they flatten and then start to come down. And, and uh, in the current circumstances, Dr. Amu, do you feel protected enough? I mean, because obviously the U.S. cannot have an effective response to the pandemic unless medical workers like you are protected. Well, under the circumstances, the protection is, is there. Now, is the protection 100%? It's impossible. It cannot be. So our exposure remains quite high because, like I said, in the first place, a lot of these patients are asymptomatic. In other words, they, sh they show no symptoms, and you make contact with them. Some that show symptoms may show symptoms of a common cold or pneumonia. So you don't know who you're, treat who you're treating until you get a test results back. Um, so do I feel protected? No, to a certain degree, but not nowhere close to 100%. Dr. Doctor, Doctor Bateau, Amu, I want to thank you very much indeed. It's, pity, it's a pity we have a sort of slightly shortened time here because we couldn't get through to you uh, at the outset. But thank you very much indeed, Dr. Bateau, Amu, who is in the front line of the uh, coronavirus fight in the United States, talking to me there on the line from Atlanta, Georgia. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and the United States. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.